Well, good afternoon. My name is Jens Hoffmann. I'm the curator of the Art Parkour section here at Art Basel. And um, I'm joined by uh, Catherine Andrews, an uh, artist from Los Angeles who's participating in Art Parkour, and uh, Abraham Cruz Villegas, who is also part of Art Parkour. And we're here to talk a little bit about some ideas of art in relationship to a uh, public place. Um, and before we do this, I just wanted to give you a quick introduction to what Art Parkour is, is about, uh, since our talk happens in the framework of this particular program. And we inaugurated Art Parkour as a sector part of Art Basel uh, three years ago. And the idea was that we uh, <coughs> wanted to bring art outside of the fair uh, into the city of uh, Basel, and um, particularly sort of looking at the rich history of Basel and um, uh, the historical sites that exist here. So we have been on three different sites over the last three years, and this year it, the whole program is taking place in an area called St. Johann Vorstadt. Um, and I hope that uh, if you haven't yet, uh, that you will go and, and, and visit um, uh, the program and the different uh, projects of the artist. Um, and um, last night uh, we had a, a presentation of um, Catherine Andrews' work, um, which was called the uh, Voix de Ville, the, the city um, voice, the voice of the city. And um, I think Catherine has prepared a number of slides that will sort of take us back to, to uh, last night and um, let us have a look at, at what happened. And perhaps we start by looking at the slides and then maybe we can have a little bit more of a conversation um, about the project okay. itself. Okay, yes, hi. Um, so I have some images uh, that I've taken, a couple um, from the proposal that I made, um, which it's interesting to me um, how to talk about this piece in relation to public art. Um, I'm not quite sure, so I'm just going to go out there and see where we go. But it's, it's interesting to me that um, Jens asked me to participate in this project, and he sort of approached me uh, with a skeleton of an idea, um, which was really fantastic for me, because a lot of the way I work is by um, using other people's ideas and um, not having too many myself when possible. <laughs> so um, actually, um, what's funny about this is that um, Jens asked me to make a proposal, which I did, and then um, as a result of uh, going through the process and working on the piece, um, the work kept changing um, due to a variety of uh, forces. Um, and in fact, um, this is a later stage of the proposal, and I don't think Jens has ever even seen this image, um, because no. to realize the project, there were various people I had to deal with, and I was sort of so far down the line dealing with certain practical concerns, um, that I was just working through the process and not bombarding Jens with millions of images. So um, I don't know that even though he invited me to do this project, um, he was aware of what it was becoming. I certainly wasn't. Um, so um, this was just sort of an early uh, idea of what it might be. It, um, basically, the work was, um, it took place along the Rhine River. And the site, oh, how do you go back? Maybe this red button? There we go. Um, on the right is the river, and um, it was a road uh, that went alongside the river. And um, the site was proposed to me. And so I spent a lot of time looking at maps and sort of imagining what could happen there. Um, and there were five architectural, well, 10, but essentially um, five architectural structures um, that made a sort of um, zigzag pattern, as you can see, and the people could pass through these structures and they could enter from one side, come out the next, and go back and forth. And in between these structures, um, what happened was a um, series of performances. This is an early um, image from the proposal, also which I think um, Jens had not seen. And I saw so, that. Yeah, he just saw it in person last night. <laughs> So then um, here's, the, here's some images. Um, and I just took these with my iPhone last night. And it's quite limited documentation because I was very busy um, sort of operating the sound and music. Um, and, and in fact, um, one thing that might be interesting to talk about is uh, I think the documentation itself serves as sort of um, 
a relic of my experience of producing something that's, quote, more public, in that um, it maybe shows a very sort of limited viewpoint um, of the work. And I, with this piece, because I was operating it, I, like, I really don't have a good idea of what happened in it. Um, so I can't talk about it uh, with too much authority. And um, I've been hearing about it um, from different people. But there were many things that came into play that were sort of beyond my control. Um, there were 12 performers. And many performers um, did actions um, that were sort of unexpected and spontaneous. Um, and then there was also, um, as the crowds were moving through the structures, lots of different things were happening. So um, essentially, the idea I had, <clears throat> my original proposal um, was to do a series of structures sort of down the center of the road. Um, and Jens and I had a good bit of back and forth around that. Um, and then about a month into working on the project, um, I was informed by the production team that it was necessary that um, this, this street I, I'm sorry I don't speak in meters, but it was about 18 feet wide. And so I was told that 11 feet of the street had to be kept clear down the, to the side, to the left or the right, so the ambulances could pass. So this was quite fascinating, because I was very, very deep into the project when I was given that information, which sort of radically um, altered the concept. But it was actually quite good, because at that time, I felt the concept wasn't working. So um, this sort of practical problem resulted in the solution that um, the center space would be kept open, um, but, but we would work with the sides <coughs> to create a kind of physical constraint so that a performer might enter the structures. The viewer would be attracted to the performer in a particular pod. I call these sections pods. Um, and then they would do their act. And then another performer would come behind the viewers and begin in another pod. And then these acts would go on simultaneously, sort of trapping the viewers in the structures. And that this type of activity would go, um, the performance lasted for almost an hour and a half. So um, it was sort of an architectural situation where the people were being herded from one, one to the next, but hurting themselves. So in a sense, um, the people um, sort of became the performers that were doing this sort of self-willed dance um, from one one sort of action or one sort of spectacle to the next. And then when the performers were done, they would turn and join the crowd and become viewers. Um, so that sort of gives you a little bit of an idea. Um, I mean, for me, if we want to have a conversation about public art, um, I think um, there's some kind of question about agency that's quite interesting, um, perhaps, to address. Um, because there's so many factors that drive realizing a project where they're more, um, that could operate on a particular scale, like for the public, and then when the public is coming, also um, what happens in that kind of interaction. Um, and, and I find it pretty bizarre that um, something like this is produced, and then it happens under the aegis um, of the artist's name, um, particularly when I had such a limited experience of the work itself, even though I was quite involved in setting up some of the terms of it. Um, so, oh, these are, and again, these photos are quite bad. They're not the official um, documentation, so it sort of shows you, um, this, like if you see this work represented somewhere, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure my gallerist would be horrified um, that I, but I, it amused me, like um, this image actually, there was one image of a viewfinder overlooking an Italian city. Um, and part of the work was about when people come to this space and they're trying to consume something, um, looking at that, looking at what the people were, were there to consume. And um, this was a photographer <clears throat> taking an image of the performance, viewing it with this sort of viewfinder behind him. Um, I'll just quickly go through these. Oh, and then here's the curator consuming his uh, baby. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is later in the evening. There was a um, sort of light show juggling act. That's it. So what's particular about this um, work, of course, is um, 
also that it is more the durational piece, an hour and a half of various performances taking place <laughs> within the context of, a, of an art fair, which again has its own particularities. And I think that especially uh, performance art has somehow become sort of a little bit of an entertainment that is attached to uh, um, art fairs, also the openings of large-scale exhibitions, biennials, and so on. Um, there was just the opening of Documenta with many different performances. And um, I think there's to a certain degree, of course, also the idea of entertaining the public, of giving them something extra beyond the experience of just looking at an exhibition, which perhaps for many people isn't as attractive as a live spectacle that unfolds in front of their eyes. And I think that... Um, your piece, and correct me if I'm wrong, was also sort of like looking at that uh, in a humorous way, uh, in a, an ironic way to a certain extent, because many of the performers that were part of your uh, piece are street performers, jugglers, um, uh, that do this for a living, and they're real professional performers. So in a way, the artist is sort of an amateur performer, if you will, compared to these people who really do this for a living. Uh, and they are becoming, uh, the, the, the real performers are finally brought into the art, uh, art world, so we can see what real performance uh, art is. The, the strong man that we saw, or the lady in the uh, Rönnrad. Are you making a distinction between that kind of performance and performance that traditionally happens within art? Or yeah, art yeah, world? yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. And I mean, I was kind of like uh, wondering what uh, the performance in part of your program or part of your piece were sort of thinking where they are being presented or where are they presenting in contrast to where they normally work. Yeah, that um, it had whole, all of it had a little bit of a, of a funfair feeling, a, a circus uh, a feeling, or like sideshows around the circus, perhaps. Mm -hmm. No, you mm -hmm. could like see maybe perhaps as the next thing is like someone who's eating fire. It sort of had that sort of atmosphere. No? Mm -hmm. And I think that the images that you had on the side were the images that sort of like brought it back to another level. That sort of like signaled, okay, there's a different investigation going on because it didn't feel as humorous or as entertaining or e easily consumable as the performances themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I mean, one of the things I was trying to do, and I think it's interesting around um, defining the term public art, is um, that um, when Jens asked me uh, to perhaps make this piece, I felt that I was asked to work with um, some very sort of like uh, set limitations in terms of what the piece should do. You know, it should be entertaining, it should be at a certain scale, um, it should provide this kind of um, experience. Uh, um, and for me that was very interesting because it was like, well, you know, maybe in some ways certain artists would be like, oh, this is a situation that's already like quite dictated, so I don't have a lot of freedom. And I thought that it was uh, nice to work with so many limitations in a way, because it's like I was entering a situation um, that was already sort of pre-scripted, and it was unclear how the artist could come to that and make it an artwork versus... Um, just traditional spectacle or something that exists outside of art, just performance. Yeah. Um, and so um, the question for me then became, you know, what could I do with these sort of um, this sort of prescripted scenario to then transform it actually into a work? And I think you're asking some question about that in terms of the images. And and um, I yeah, tried yeah. to work with sort of that conceit that was already set up, and then have the viewers um, have a bodily experience that also made them perhaps question more deeply their relationship to that type of entertainment. Um, but it was, it was subtle too. It, it was pronounced and at the same time it was subtle. I mean, some people were like, what did we just see? Was that yeah. just a month before someone from the freeze fair had texted me, they had gone to an after party to see a vaudevillian there was like a vaudevillian um, show at an after party and they were sending me all these texts. They didn't know I was working on this project and I thought, oh great, I'm just the next person at the next fair providing the entertainment for the party. Um, and is there a gesture here that could like break um, it simply being entertainment? Yeah. But again, I don't really know if it <coughs> succeeded in that or not because I was in the 
in the cave, so. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with entertainment. Um, so um, and I was very entertained, and um, <laughs> particularly by the skills of the performers. Uh, the skills were uh, extreme, and I'd actually never really seen something like that. Uh, and this is interesting, again, in contrast to art, no, where perhaps skill is not of the major issue anymore in terms of you know, when you produce a work of art. It, it becomes more about the ideas and the concept and sort of larger intellectual engagement, whereas here it was just clearly re-applauding the skill of uh, the acrobats. But I think the question um, becomes, uh, if the piece has to perform certain things to sort of like please the public or serve the public, to what degree can criticality be entered into the equation and how can it be factored in? Well, I think because of its <coughs> like um, extreme focus on that um, idea of like a spectacle, the circus, a sideshow, it really made that apparent to me, you know. And and um, especially, what are these guys called with the long legs? Still walkers. The still walkers. They they had like this quality that really brought this in for me because they were very. Uh, bringing the public in, they talk to, to everyone, and, and there I felt like th those guys were extremely good performers and, and, and engaged the public very well, and uh, um, for me those sort of like really brought it over. But I wanted to just quickly go back before I, we talk with Abraham about this idea of um, having something that is very framed already given, and you have to sort of fill in a blank. Um, I always wonder, because once you go to the fair, you see so many paintings and, and <clears throat> Um, I think some of the things that happen now at Alpacua are exactly sort of like the result of trying to break out of a pre-subscribed mm. form that could mm. be like a canvas or any other sort of like more mm. traditional uh, mm -hmm. uh, notion, notion of art. And it is interesting that in your case, you're sort of like going back to something from another era almost um, and, and bring that in into the art context in order to sort of leave it at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, Abram Cruz Villegas is presenting a film in, in <coughs> Art Parkour, and um, perhaps you could talk a little bit about the film, how it uh, sort of <coughs> was realized, uh, and um, uh, the relationship perhaps between the neighborhood uh, where it was filmed and uh, sort of where we present it now, which is quite different neighborhood, but it's still sort of like a residential uh, setting. Yeah. Well, the, the film is called Autoconstrucción, and it was shot in 2009. And it comes from a long uh, project series called Autoconstrucción, all of them. And they are related to my, my neighborhood and how it was, how, how it evolved starting in the 60s when I was born. Um, it's a piece of land in the south of Mexico City, a volcanic land area where people took the land illegally and they started building their houses like that, like using found materials, but using also the volcanic rock. Then I've been trying to understand my own process as a person, most, more than as an artist, that, like trying to understand the processes and the way people made their houses, improvising and using whatever they had at hand. Then I just uh, made this film um, uh, for trying to describe the, the, the place, the houses, not, not having a narrative thing like a story or something. And it's just like uh, having the, the, the neighborhood, the houses, the facades, the materials, and what could be happening inside, which is sex in this case. So you can find in the, in the film uh, some couples uh, having sex, and it's real sex. They are not acting, they are not professional actors, and it's a combination of energies and different processes that are in this film. And I think it, it, there is some kind of bigger idea about the public space that we have in, as I think, not only in Mexico City, but in many other cities, in which because of the economic situation or the history of my country, in this case, led people to, to improvise and to make things out of nothing. And then they, they think, that we think that sometimes the body is kind of an extension of our mind, and then the house where we live is an extension of our body, and the street is, is an extension of our house, and the city is an extension of our street. I mean, the city is something like, like you can use as something that belongs to you. There is no real difference 
I'm not, I'm not talking about the whole city, but some areas like this one in where I grew up, that's very important. People organize uh, parties and activities in the street, community things, in, like really using the, the word community in a proper way. So the public space, it's more than something that you inhabit while, while going to, the, to your job or going to your office or going to the school. It's something that is an extension of your own body and mind. So in this, in this case, I think it was very important for me to make this, this, this work. And now I think it's important now to have it here in Art Park Cool because it's more like instead of taking the art to the streets, it's taking the street to the art place, maybe. And it's a real one. It's not like a set. It's not acted. It's not, uh, yeah, it's not like a, it, it's real, let's say. <clears throat> and there's this big contrast between the city that is shown in your film and that particular street uh, uh, here in, in, in Basel, which is, you know, has been there for 500 years and has had some changes, but uh, the, the, the street and the, the neighborhood that you depict in the film is very young and it's kind of self-made with any sort of, like, without any uh, architectural plan or urban plan. Uh, and I thought that was an interesting um, relationship there as well, where in your case, a lot of these buildings are kind of built out of ma found material, out of like economic necessity. There's just no money to buy uh, uh, building material, and here you have this sort of almost fairy tale-like street uh, in, in Switzerland. Yeah, well, I think it's it's that's something important as well because uh, when I work as a sculptor, I make my work with found materials as well, and that's why I was wondering how I work this way. Why do I arrive? I, how I arrived to be myself, in a way, but not only as, a, as an artist, but also as a citizen. And then I found that many things are related to this economic principle in which we work, I mean, I work with materials that are discarded by other people. They think it, they don't work anymore, but for me, it's, it's, it's prime matter. And then that way, in this context, I think the clash, the economic clash you can find, like looking at this film, watching this film in this specific context, can make you think in different ways of uh, approaching not only like a city or citizenship, but also economics and politics and history. And then that's a good thing. Yeah, I think the way that you approach sight has a lot to do with like how do we create a sense of self and how is that related to sort of like the history and the current realities of the place that we, we live in. And I think your uh, um, work perhaps stands like in a nice contrast also to the work of Claude Levesque, which is at the beginning of Art Parcours, which is a caravan uh, that is uh, on, a, on a plinth and has uh, the stars and then sort of like talks about migration and movement, but also about standstill and, and the impossibility of sort of continuation. And um, another project that you have done in your uh, neighborhood in uh, Mexico City is something that I wanted to talk a little bit about because it also relates to the art fair and the idea of like you know, running a gallery, um, and um, that is you know, your yeah. art space that you, you are running in a street corner in your, in your neighborhood. Yeah. Well, uh, there is this, uh, another, this uh, different project I've been making with friends uh, since 2010, and maybe we can show the images now. And it's, uh, the, the, it's a gallery, properly. It's called La Galeria de Comercio. And the name, using the word comercio, is because it's in, in the commerce street. It's the name of the street. It's not uh, something we, we, we added. So uh, we organize events every month. Um, can we go to the next, please? Or maybe? Oh, you have yeah. it here. Ah, yes. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> oh, yeah. So I don't know if you can see, but do we have a statement in which we say, uh, that is a place for making projects in the street. We don't have a, a room or a, a, an inner space, let's say a house or, or a gallery or anything, but we use the street. And we invite people, not only artists, to make things every, every month there without budget, without production. Uh, there is no objects in between. There is no, nothing we have or hold or sell. It's just having an event every month. And we organize, for instance, uh, musical events, uh, book launchings, um, and as you can see, we are just appealing to the passerby. We are not. Make, I mean, we have and we use uh, the website and the email and the the social networks for calling people to come. But it's not only for a art audience, but also and mainly for the local audience that we have in that neighborhood.
is this, and we have like, we, I mean, the, the idea of using this space, this corner, is because it's a very busy corner. There is a pharmacy, there is a bar, there is a school, there is uh, many businesses and many, many, uh, a, a lot of activity. So we are also trying to take energy from the, from the street instead of thinking that we are bringing something to the people there. So we are not trying to be demagogic or populist that way. When you think like, when you do something in the street, you are bringing art or culture to people in the street. But the opposite, we are trying to take advantage of this situation for our own project. Yeah. There we organize like uh, stamp workshops, drawing workshops, um, collaborative thing, performances, uh, sensors of uh, all living <coughs> beings there in the corner. We invited our biologists to make an account of everything there, plants, animals, including animals, I mean humans, which are the same, skateboarders, and so on. Jens, why did you ask myself and Abraham to speak? Like, you could have asked other people. I'm curious why you chose us and if there was... That's it. Some... If you thought there was some relationship to draw out or something. <clears throat> well, you're both sculptors both very much sculptors, but at the same time, both of you work uh, or have other concerns within uh, uh, sculpture, or very sort of concerns that go move beyond very much uh, beyond sculpture. So I thought that there was perhaps a relationship between the two of you. But also, just to sort of answer your question in a very pragmatic way, I think we have like right now sort of like a dialogue, you and I, over the last couple of months about various projects and ideas. So I just felt very comfortable of, of asking you to, to uh, and also using this as an opportunity to continue the dialogue. And Abraham and I have been talking for the last 10 years, so um, it was you know, just simply a, a way of continuing these sort of like conversations. Um. I, I think it's interesting that um, in both of the projects there's a kind of inversion going on that um, asks for a sort of reconsideration of um, maybe Basel or the art parkour location or even maybe um, Switzerland in general, or you could keep expanding that outwards. Um, in terms of your taking um, your project on the streets of Mexico and then transplanting it here, and how does that play out, um, as you're saying, when you're perceiving it from this seemingly like idyllic um, sort of environment. Yeah. And in the piece that I made, um, by the choice of imagery, I was attempting to do something similar, and we had even had a conversation about it because. One thing that I realized in researching all the different performers was that in that genre of performance, um, there are many um, types of acts that play on um, uh, like tropes of nat nationality or nationalism in different ways that sort of like within tease the genre that out of or yeah, in, in within the genre of like vaudevillian type oh, okay. street type performance. Yeah, yeah. Like for example, the stilt walkers that I used had performed that particular act and had constructed those costumes for something they did in Bahrain. And so they had flags as an option that I could use that were um, representative of that. So I was like, well, do I choose those flags or do I use these other more abstract ones? And what would that do to the content of, of this piece? Or you could just go down the line and imagine a million different types of uh, performances that are specific to a country. And um, early in the proposal, or um, uh, I had sent um, some images to Jens, and, he, and actually they had um, quite a bit of content um, that was more specific to Switzerland. And we had some conversation about the degree to which the piece could acknowledge um, its relationship to Switzerland and whether that would be um, a good thing or a tricky thing to deal with. And it was actually, um, I mean, I wasn't interested in per se poking fun at any particular 
nationality or region, um, but I was interested in trying to work with an idea of site specificity, and yeah. I was trying to deal with what it means for um, the public to come to this place to consume these objects, and what it is about this place that might facilitate that. And I think there is um, some question about um, idealism and the association of that to a particular place um, that's interesting. And I did, in the end, um, work with uh, some imagery depicting Switzerland, yeah. or uh, sort of vaguely, so I also tossed in an image of an Italian city, so it wasn't like I was like pointedly um, uh, dealing with that. But um, I was in a sort of like um, sly way attempting to ask a question about um, what does it mean for the people to come to this place with this desire to consume? What is it that this place offers in terms of a kind of um, beautiful, um, you know, whatever? Like, and and what are um, what's sort of the aftermath of that process of consumption? Like, what happens um, when we all come here and party and then we all get wasted and the next day we have to give a talk, but we're hungover? You know, there was an image of a man who yeah. was. Um, he was with his beer glass and he was drunk and his head was down and the Alps were in the background. Um, and so <laughs> I, I was attempting to sort of in a, in a, and, and the, um, the viewer's own experience I was hoping would double that so that they would um, get drawn into these structures by the spectacle that they were consuming and then another would happen next to them and then they were trapped. Um, they were trapped in essence by their own desire which had um, propelled them into this sort of stuck position. Um, so I think there is a sort of interesting relationship there um, in sort of the subtle ways I was trying to question um, what happens in a place and what's specific to a place and the relationship of that to consumption. There's a relationship there between that and um, your piece as well in terms of um, the questions you're asking about, uh, you know, what happens in this city, what's the differentiation between public and private, can those lines be blurred, how close can we go in and our act to consume, and then you're there like, you know, getting the imagery of the people having sex or whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then the viewer just sort of doubles that in their mm -hmm. um, watching of your piece. I, I don't know, in my case, I think it, um, this project I did, I meant, I, I made it thinking that it can be read in any context, different ways, of course, according to the environment, the, of course, economic, political, historical. But it's, it's, it's very, I mean, what I want to say is very precise. It's, it's coming from my experience, and it's using the image to be consumed of sex, and it's real sex. It's, I, I'm, I'm always, when I talk about this, I clarify that it's not pornography, because it's not pornography. In that way, economically, it makes a total difference. But it happens that when you enter the, 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 the room, the theater, and you watch the film since the very beginning, you find something that is not, it, can, it might not be very amusing, in fact, which is sex. <clears throat> it's, it's the real thing there, what you see, is not to amuse people. No, I, I, I know that many people feel it very uncomfortable when they're I watching know, this film. But the purpose is, is, is not, again, to make people angry. It's just to describe people, things as they are. The streets, the houses, the materials, the structure, the process of making these houses as an ideologic thing, and then sex as an element of this. And of course it's to be consumed. If not, I would not make it. I mean, consumed in different ways as a language, as discourse, as commodity again, why not? But at the same time, I think, in a, going back to the discursive way, I think appealing to the context, it can be understood, enriched by this very context of the art fair. I, don't, I mean, it's, it's something very specific, of course, it's not a museum. And uh, in that way, I think, for me, it's a challenge again to, be, to, be, to include my work in this specific thing. And I think it can, as I said, it can be enriched and it can grow different ways. But it's not, I mean, I don't want to be didactic, I don't want to be 
to address something, a message to anybody about sex or pornography or architecture or nothing. It's just, it's just an opinion from my own experience in this context. Yeah. But it's interesting that the, the context of an art fair would provide an opportunity to actually explore issues of uh, site and context and place. Where, uh, you know, we have all been to art fairs, and uh, at certain points you don't really distinguish whether this is the art fair that is taking place in Hong Kong or in Miami or in New York. They sort of like seem to become all very um, similar and identical to, to each other. And, <clears throat> and I don't know how much art parkour in the end is sort of very <laughs> specific to Basel, or if again this is also sort of simpler, a simply a formula that sort of like, you know, is being applied onto the matrix of the city that we then sort of, you know, move and play around with. Um, I think we sort of have to come to an end with our um, conversation here, but perhaps there are some questions uh, from the audience. Um, this would be the opportunity to uh, uh, ask um, the artist or myself about their work or the, the project. So please feel free. I think there's a microphone. Maybe I want to add something. Yeah. <clears throat> right now, I mean, it's a, it's a different environment again. But what I'm doing in, in Documenta, it's a project that is not visible to the audience. And that's a challenge for me, because it's not that I, don't, I want to be invisible uh, in terms of the, of the art environment or the art context or the art world. I, I, I think it's part of Documenta, and that way it's impossible to escape from that. Uh, but I, what I'm doing is making events every day in the street, using the public space to make my work that I improvise with found materials I find in wherever I, I walk. And so I cannot announce the events, and I cannot say where it, they will happen. So it's only me witnessing this. And at the end, there will be a book like, uh, with the whole project. But during the, all this process, which is like six or seven weeks, and in, be, in, in the middle is the opening of Documenta, it was, uh, nobody's seen anything. <coughs> And that's also a good question about like uh, the, how it, it, it can be inserted or yeah. how it can exist in any possible discussion if it's not visible or if it's not for amusing or it's not like a show or a, a, like a, you know, like a spectacle. And it's a, I mean, it's a good question for myself now. Well, I think your participation with this particular idea of being invisible or having these things pop up in the context of document is only possible because there's already 150 artists that actually have something visible. If it would be a group of four artists, you certainly probably would not have the opportunity to do something that would be so invisible. Mm -hmm. So it's also part, again, of like a particular structure that uh, has certain variables. Yeah, but it's also uh, it's part of the language and part of the <laughs> vocabulary of artists we use because it's not about, as I said, it's not about like going against anything or not wanting to be uh, known or seen. It's yeah. more like a part of an, a research of mine. Well, it relates very much to the gallery in Mexico, no? Exactly. Yeah. So is there um, any questions? <laughs> Otherwise, we can bring this to an end. And OK, well, thank you very much for uh, your um, attention and for coming to the talk. And thanks to uh, Catherine and Abraham for uh, the presentation. Thank you. <laughs>